Welcome to the programme. We begin with breaking news coming out of South Africa, where the Nobel Peace Prize winner, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, has died. Appointed the first black Archbishop of Cape Town, Tutu rose to prominence in the 1980s as a vocal opponent of apartheid. He was 90 years old. Let's go to our correspondent, Fermida Miller, who's following events for us uh, in Johannesburg and joins me on the phone. Uh, Fermida, uh, along with Nelson Mandela, he really was South Africa's moral compass through very dark times. That's certainly the case. And as we listen to tributes coming in this morning, shortly um, of, after his death, we hear from people who talk about a man who was led by his conscience irrespective of the topic at hand. He was somebody who was even critical of the existing political leadership, one that he fought for during the days of apartheid. His belief was always centered around justice, around what the rights of people and what was important to South Africans. And I just quickly want to read one line from the tribute from the presidency saying that Desmond Tutu was a patriot without equal, a leader of principle and pragmatism who gave meaning to the biblical insight that faith without works is dead. He stood his ground, didn't he, Fermida? He wasn't afraid to eyeball his adversaries over a career that was, what, decades in the making? Not at all. And we saw this especially during his fight during apartheid or against apartheid, his time abroad um, when he was in the UK, as well as on his return into, to South Africa when he chaired the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, in the early 90s. And that was just after apartheid was dismantled, where he wanted answers from people. He wanted to hold people accountable for the atrocities that had occurred. And those were also scenes where we saw the um, Archbishop break down in tears, devastated by some of the testimony that he had heard. But he continued, as I say, to be a man of conscience in dealing with the ongoing social and racial issues in South Africa, irrespective of the opponent he was facing. And this is where you might say he gained global respect, because wherever he went across the African continent and set definitely to Europe, Asia and the Americas, people wanted to listen to him. They wanted to hear his point of view, because what he said resonated at that time in that place, in that country. And that's absolutely the case. And even when you hear from people who interacted with him, they say it was with great sincerity. He was a man without any airs and graces. And, and very much, you can't separate the Archbishop from his um, Christian beliefs and what he thought was correct, um, and also what was key in terms of the role that he played in this country. When there were political... Uh, people like Nelson Mandela, uh, who were imprisoned at the time, he kept the fires burning. He kept the fires burning in terms of that fight against apartheid. And, and that is the kind of message that was respected. And then also sticking to his principles, his, essentially. But just really, it's his humility and sincerity that always won people over. Fermida, we'll leave it there for now, of course. Continue to follow the tributes that come in with you from South Africa. You're in Johannesburg. Thanks very much. Jonah Hull looks back now at Desmond Tutu's life. <laughs> this is Desmond Tutu hearing the news that Nelson Mandela would soon be released. He was seldom one to contain his feelings. It, it just triggered me off. This Tutu's response as head of South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission on hearing details of atrocities committed by both sides. If apartheid is not dismantled, then we are going to have a bloodbath. Desmond Mpilo Tutu was born in a mining town outside Johannesburg at a time of strict segregation. Things would get much worse as he grew up. Tutu was 17 when the National Party came to power in 1948. Racial inequality became law, apartheid. He'd wanted to be a doctor but became a teacher instead, witnessing firsthand the government's policy of depriving black South Africans of education, consigning them to servitude, and the protests that followed, like the Sharpeville massacre in 1960. 69 people were killed, and most of them were shot in the back as they were running away, protesting against the past laws. I remember it as a, as a moment when um, you realized uh, that black life was cheap. 
Tutu must have thought he could do more in the church. He joined the clergy, eventually obtaining high Anglican office as Dean of Johannesburg and later Archbishop of Cape Town. It propelled him into the public eye as an unflinching moral voice. Why our struggle is going to succeed is not just because of numbers. Our struggle is going to succeed because it is a just struggle. By 1984, Desmond Tutu had won global admiration. He was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. It was the kind of recognition that South Africa's anti-apartheid movement needed to become a global force. For a very, very long time, I, I did hope that uh, the world would, would hear our plea. And that is why we urge the world to apply sanctions. Archbishop Desmond Tutu was one of the world's foremost human rights campaigners, an active member of the elders in the cause of world peace, remembered as much for his unremitting optimism and infectious <laughs> laugh. When he introduced Nelson Mandela as South Africa's new president in 1994, Tutu recalled that he whispered to God, if I die now, it would be almost the perfect moment. Someone up there must really have been on our side or, or betting for us. When Mandela died, many worried that South Africa had lost its moral compass. They may now wonder whether it's lost its guiding light. Trevor Phillips is a British anti-apartheid campaigner and chair of the Equality and Human Rights Commission. Joins me now from London. Good morning, Mr Phillips. I know that you knew the Archbishop very well. I can only begin to imagine the memories and the conversations that will be swirling around in your head right now when you think back at the man that we've lost. Good morning, Sahel. Yes, um, I in fact knew him rather more uh, as a person, if I can put it that way, than the public figure, because his son, uh, who's also called Trevor, and I were um, contemporaries at university, and we've been friends for now, gosh, half a century. Um, but I think, obviously, the important uh, thing for uh, most of the world, actually, right now, is the loss of what I think your correspondent correctly described as this um, towering moral figure. Um, I think the important uh, issue, thing to remember about him is that during the uh, last days or the end of the apartheid era, many of the people who fought that battle uh, were either out of the country or they were in jail. He had uh, a unique freedom which most people would probably not have ex exercised in quite the, uh, the, 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 the extraordinary way that he did. Um, he was able to speak out. He was able to draw attention to the awful uh, characteristics of that system uh, because, to some extent, he was protected. Uh, but the fact that he was protected by the dog collar, if I can put it that way, mm. Uh, doesn't shouldn't lessen our regard for his courage because all sorts of people suffered during that period. Indeed, he, he would go, he would, he would be under house arrest, he would go in and out of South Africa, he would have his passport removed and confiscated by uh, Pick Boat, who was a, a prime minister uh, of South Africa at the time, president of uh, South Africa at the time. You know, we tend to think, as you say, you can't be protected by the dog collar, but, you know, he wasn't afraid of eyeballing his adversaries. And I think that's why perhaps many across the world will uh, pay tribute to him for that strength of character. And a strength of character that he got from black South Africans and other anti-apartheid leaders? Yes, and I think we often forget with these um, great figures that, that they have lives too. Um, I, I look at this, as I say, to some extent through um, the eyes of uh, one of his uh, children's friends. And it, it's worth saying that for him... Uh, that courage wasn't just a matter of a sort of personal courage, but it was he knew that there would be a price to pay for him, he himself, but also for every member of his family. And he persuaded them, brought them along, enfolded them, 
and as far as he could, stood in front of them. And that, that's, yeah. uh, but I think, you know, we forget that for him, he knew that those close to him were also paying a price. And that, in many ways, I suspect, would be more, would have been more of a, a heartbreak, more of a, mm. more painful for him than anything that might have happened to him. But still, yeah. he saw the the greater need, the bigger cause, and fought it, frankly, to, to today. Because let's remember, he hasn't been particularly sparing in his criticism of the current post-apartheid government as well. And that's no. what I mean when I say this moral character always shone through. Indeed, uh, and yet, to, uh, I see you've given us a sense of how, you might say, uh, uh, decent a chap he was and uh, where he stood when it came to family and professional duty. So finally, Mr Phillips, I've got to ask you, when, you, when we talk about global greats such as Martin Luther King, Gandhi, Mandela, he would modestly, most probably say, I don't want to be in that list, but do you think he is up there in that list? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. He, he's it up there in that celestial choir. And I suspect that we will, at some point, um, when we join him, we'll be hearing that infectious laugh, and he will be leading the, the conga, and he will be telling jokes. And uh, it's worth saying, this is the guy who brought humanity to politics. He brought the common touch. Not that easy, even uh, to, to see, even amongst these great moral figures. This, this was a man that you knew you could spend an afternoon or an evening with, and you would no doubt deal with the large issues, but you'd go away happy and laughing. Uh, so let's not forget, this was a great human being as well. And I'm sure that's how it'll be remembered. Trevor Phillips there joining us uh, from London. Thanks so much for joining us, and thanks for your time. My pleasure.